Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. Is there, is there a microphone on? Is there a microphone here? I, can I be heard? Yes. I can be heard. Okay, because I can't see a microphone, so I just, uh, right. Um, uh, my name is Roderick Beaton, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you um, here uh, to this lecture this evening. I'm director of the Centre for Hellenic Studies here at King's College London, and uh, on behalf of the Centre and the Department of Classics, um, I'd like to welcome you most warmly this evening to the second annual Jamie Rumble Memorial Fund Lecture. Uh, that's a little bit of a mouthful. Um, I hope I got it right. Um, before, we, uh, before we start, I'd like just to say a couple of things. Uh, first of all, in the Centre for Hellenic Studies and Department for, of Classics, we are um, we're, we're hyperactive. We have lots of events. Um, and this is a poster for our next main public event, um, which is a two-day conference on daimones, spaces, and places in the Greek world. It's not too late to sign up for that on the 27th and 28th of March. That's next Friday and Saturday. And the annual international conference of the Centre for Hellenic Studies this year will be held in Athens uh, on the 8th to 10th of May on the subject of music, language, and identity in modern Greece, defining a national art music in the 19th and 20th centuries. So as you'll see just from that very brief uh, announcement, we, we in, at King's, in Classics and Hellenic Studies, we really do like to cover the centuries. Um, and we're very glad to welcome you here to help us do that. By an interesting coincidence, the topic of tonight's <coughs> lecture has a particular resonance with the um, professional expertise at the very highest level of King's College London. Our new president and principal, Professor Ed Byrne, is by training and profession himself a neuroscientist. And our vice principal for arts and sciences, Professor Evelyn Welsh, is of course a very well-known uh, art historian. Um, sadly, in the, it's the nature of running a large university like King's these days that uh, these people are able to be with us, alas, only in spirit, but I'm assured that they are. And indeed, I understand that Professor Welch will hope to, hopes to join us during the reception later this evening. So it falls to me to make the introduction uh, instead in the absence of the great and good. Uh, the Rumble Fund comes about thanks to the generosity of an anonymous alumnus of the classical, <coughs> classical MA in archaeology. It has a very special purpose at King's, which is to fund undergraduate and postgraduate travel to classical lands as part of their taught undergraduate and graduate <laughs> degrees. And each year, the fund takes a group of around 25 <coughs> BA and MA students around uh, classical lands. The first two trips were to Greece, uh, uh, led by Michael Squire last no uh, a year past November, and led by Alexia Pizzali uh, just last month. Um, and the fund generously covers the full cost of these, uh, of these trips. Um, all of this, the fund and the annual lecture, um, are inspirationally managed and overseen by my colleague Dr. Michael Squire, to whom I'll hand over in a moment to introduce the lecture. But as Michael will, I'm sure, be too modest to say anything about himself, uh, forgive me if I do it for him. <coughs> uh, Michael Squire is lecturer in classical Greek art, He's the author of uh, a huge number of, uh, of articles. Um, and in the year 2011 alone, he published two significant and highly regarded monographs. One, The Art of the Body, Antiquity, Antiquity and Its Legacy, and the other, The Iliad in a, nut in a Nutshell. Uh, the book is not by any means nutshell size, I assure you. Um, so Michael Squire is our, um, our, our energetic uh, master of ceremonies this <coughs> evening, promoter of the Rumble Fund activities uh, here at King's, uh, expert on art, visual culture, and the reception of both in antiquity and beyond. So I hand over immediately to Michael Squire to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you very much, Roddy. I hope everyone can hear me roughly all right. Um, good. It's a very um, great pleasure to welcome you all on behalf not only of the Centre of Hellenic Studies, but also the Department of Classics here at King's and the Institute of Classical Studies, with whom this is a collaborative project. Um, before I introduce the speaker, John and Irons himself, 
I just want to, again, give you a couple of pictures to <laughs> illustrate some of the things Roddy has already talked about, namely about the Jamie Rumble Memorial Fund. Um, as Roddy explained, this is a pretty unique fund in uh, the context of British tertiary education. It's one of those rare beacons of light in what can be sometimes um, a fairly uh, bleak landscape. And it's, I think what's very special about this fund is that it's entirely dedicated to our students here at King's. As Roddy explained, the main purpose of the fund is to take up to 25 students per year to classical lands, twice to Greece, but next year to Rome, with all expenses paid and um, to be guided around the sites by King's lecturers and as part of their King's modules here in the Classics Department. Um, before I tell you a little bit more about what the fund has done, um, I do want to say something about the honourant of the fund, Jamie Rumble. As Roddy explained, the Jamie Rumble Fund comes about thanks to the gener generosity of a former alumnus in our Classical Archaeology MA programme, but it's named after a close personal friend, namely, namely Jamie Rumble himself. Jamie didn't study at King's, nor did he study classics, but he was absolutely passionate about equal opportunities for all and passionate about everyone um, achieving their true potential, not only in educational <coughs> contexts, but in all manner of other contexts as well. And I think that Jamie himself would have been very proud of the work that the Rumble Fund does. Um, you can read more about the Rumble Fund online at the King's website, but I just wanted to show you in practice what the fund looks like. Um, this is a trip last year um, directed by Alexia Petsalis Diomedis to Athens and to Greece. You can see at the top there a nice picture of 25 contented students in Delphi um, and down below reading um, or hearing about the Kalonikos in Athens. Um, likewise, one of the particular projects of the funds is really to get hands-on with ancient objects. Um, and we're very proud to be working here with our collaborative partners, the British School at Athens and the British School at Rome. Um, so the first purpose of this brief introduction is to say something about the Rumble Fund, and I hope some of you will find out more about it online. But the second function of this very brief introduction is the most important, namely to introduce our speaker tonight, Professor John Onions from the University of East Anglia. Um, John studied classics at Cambridge and went on to do his graduate work just next door at the Courtauld Institute and at the Warburg, supervised by no greater mentor than uh, Ernst Gombrich himself. And I think that influence of Gombrich's interest in cognitive studies will come out in our lecture tonight. Um, John is one of those very rare art historians who is equally famous in the field of classics as in the field of art history. Um, among classicists, he's perhaps best known um, not only for his 1979 book, Art and Thought in the Hellenistic Age, and not only for his 1990s book on classical architecture, Bearers of Meaning, or indeed for his 1999 book on the cultures of ancient Greece and Rome. But among art historians, John has an even broader and wider reputation. He was the founding editor of Art History, still the leading journal within the field in 1978, and since then has published, well, far too many monographs and edited books for me to mention, not only in the context of Renaissance art, but also more broadly in the field of cognitive studies. And I think what we're going to hear more of tonight is one of John's latest research interests, namely that of what he labelled neuroart history, um, and most famously, of course, in the book of 2008 of the same name, where he traced um, what he called neuroart history all the way back from the ancient Greeks, from Aristotle and Pliny to the 21st century. So, John, it's a very great pleasure to welcome you tonight. We're very pleased that you can be the 2015 Rumble Lecturer, and we hugely look forward to your talk. Thanks. No, thank you, Michael. And uh, thanks to the Rumble Fund for, in, for inspiring the whole project of these, of, of these lectures. Uh, I should say that I have a particular pleasure in speaking here tonight because uh, 55 years or so ago, I first came to 
kings to uh, see my sister, who's here tonight, um, star in uh, the Euripides, uh, Euripides play, uh, Hercules Furens, The Madness of Hercules. Some of you may think that I've been infected from that uh, trip, but it did make me realize how important it is to get a lot of people together looking and enjoying something and how kings can play a, an important role in creating uh, classical studies and strengthening classical studies. So I will uh, get the light on. I, I don't need... I, do you turn off the lights in the hall because for the images or... I, I don't know how they look. Because I don't... It's fine? Okay, okay, okay. Anyway, I'd like to begin with a question, with one that only you can answer. What did you think when you first saw my title? Some of you may have been just curious as to what I might have to say. Some of them were probably an, a bit annoyed. What you may have said to yourself is this essentializing nonsense about Greeks being rectangular and Romans round. Surely we've learned to move beyond such stereotypes. And why invoke neuroscience as an approach to culture? How can we apply neuroscience to people we can no longer put in a scanner? I have every sympathy with such rep responses. After all, until recently, mine would have been very similar. So it may be helpful if I first explain what caused me <coughs> to change my own view. Most important was the fact that I found myself working in a school of world art studies. This meant that I could not continue to treat classical and indeed all European art as somehow normal and natural. For the first time, I had to treat Europe as just another dark continent, with its own artistic traditions every bit as mysterious as those as Africa, of Africa. I also had to ask much bigger questions than I had, was used to asking, questions about the differences in the generic properties of cultures. Why, for instance, have Europeans for the last 2,000 years made most of their buildings out of stone, while the Chinese, with similar technical and material resources, have made theirs out of wood. It certainly has nothing to do with earthquakes because seismic activity is endemic in both China and Greece. Otherwise, I could find no answers to such questions in the literatures on either culture. Indeed, it soon became clear that it was the literatures that prevented people asking such questions. Because ancient Greeks and ancient Chinese both treated their own behaviors as normal, later scholars did too. What I needed to find out was why people, even in the most Self-conscious traditions have no idea what makes that tradition special. Is there, I wonder, a part of the mind to which even the most intelligent have no access? It was in pursuit of answers to this question that I turned to neuroscience. What I have learned since what I've learned since I first looked at the brain 20 years ago astonished me. The latest neuroscience I discovered has completely transformed our view of the, what goes on in here. It's hard to overstate this transformation. It used to be thought that each of us was born with a brain whose configuration was basically stable throughout our lives and that this was subsequently filled with surrounding culture and our own thoughts. What we now know is that the brain does not maintain a stable configuration but is highly plastic. That is liable to change because many of the connections between our 100 billion neurons Um, are liable to either grow, as we see here, or fall away throughout our lives, all depending on whether we use them more or less. Every experience we have, every action we perform, relies on a particular set of connections, and the more often we have that experience or perform that action, the more the connections involved will strengthen, especially if that experience or action engages us intently. The process involved applies to all areas of the brain, but it is particularly well understood in the area of the visual cortex at the back of our heads. You can see the visual cortex at the back of the brain here. The more often and the more intensely we look at anything, the more the networks involved in the perception of its particular properties, such as those of line or color, color will develop. And the most significantly, as a result, we will acquire a preference for looking at anything that shares those properties. This means that the more we know what an individual at any place or period has been looking at frequently and intently, the better we will be able to reconstruct the preferences 
to guide their choices, whether as makers, patrons, or simply as viewers of art. Moreover, if we know what visceral concerns caused them to look so frequently and intently at a particular object or phenomenon in the first place, we will have a good idea of what their feelings are when they are making or looking at something that shares its particular properties. In other words, a knowledge of this principle helps us to reconstruct much of what works of art meant to people, something they themselves couldn't tell us because the process is one of which they would have been completely unaware. This is highly important for the history of culture. People who live in a particular place with its own natural, social, and material environment will look at very different things and as a diff result acquire, different, acquire neural resources that are unique which will influence all their behaviors. But because they have no idea that this is the case, they have no possibility of explaining that influence. The only person who can do that is someone who uses a knowledge of the principles of neural plasticity that govern neural formation to reconstruct these resources. And another important way to reconstruct people's unconscious mental life is through an understanding of neural mirroring. The, underst <clears throat> the understanding of neural mirroring began when it was discovered that some of the neurons in a monkey's brain, which are activated when it makes a particular movement, are also activated when it merely observes another monkey or a human making that movement without itself moving at all. Later, a similar phenomenon was identified in humans, so that if you look at me when I'm doing something like waving my hands, the neural resources in your own motor cortex that support similar movements will be activated, although you remain immobile. This explains why, from the moment we open our eyes, we learn the movements of adults and also learn what those movements mean to them without any consciousness that this is so. This is why we socialize so automatically. If we sit opposite someone, we will start to mirror their actions and facial movements, and even the emotions and thoughts that these actions and, fa and facial movements and emo uh, uh, express. Again, without us being conscious that this is happening. Significantly, too, this predisposition disposition is so strong that it affects our relationship not just with people, but with everything, whether animate or inanimate. This is this is the property of Einfühlung, or empathy, already recognized in the 19th century. It is such empathy that may cause us to look like our, come to look like our pets. Even my highly cerebral teacher, Ernst Gombrich, experienced this viscerally when he visited the zoo. As he used to say, when I'm in the uh, hippopotamus enclosure, I feel like a hippopotamus. And when I'm in the cage of the weasels, I feel like a weasel. Another distinguished art historian, Wolflin, noted the same effect in our relation to inanimate objects. If we look at a tiny stone, we start to feel tiny, and if we look at a shape that is horizontal, we start to feel lazy. Evidently, if we know what phenomena <clears throat> an individual has been looking at, we can reconstruct the properties with which he has empathized and so acquired. Now, these two newly discovered principles, neural plasticity and neural mirroring, provide vital access to the minds of others wherever and whenever they live. Familiarity with the principle of neural plasticity means that if we know what people in a particular place and time were looking at frequently and intently, we can reconstruct the salient properties of their neural resources and so gain insights into their visual preferences. Familiarity with the principle of neural mirroring means that if we know what plants or animals, materials or man-made objects people in a particular place and time were looking at frequently and intently, we construct something of what they might have felt about themselves. There are large areas of the mind, in other words, to which it's, the mind's owner has no access, but which are accessible to an outsider, provided he or she has a knowledge of the principles governing neural formation. These principles provide a new key to the understanding of all types of cultural expressions, ranging from myths to art. So, now we can return to the dark continent of Europe at the dawn of classical culture. What light can knowledge of the principles outlined above shed on the first products of that culture from the early first, first millennium BC. Now, a good place to begin is with Greeks own, the Greeks' own myths of their origins, some, some of which are quite unlike those of all other peoples. Most creation stories tell how humans either descend from a plant or an animal, or were made by gods out of some sort of paste, either maize flour in the stories of pre-Columbian America, or clay, as in the Bible. There is a trace of this last story in the myth of Prometheus, but other Greek accounts are very different, 
crediting humans with a more mineral nature. Most important is the story of how, following a punitive flood, only two people, Deucalion and Pyrrha, were left. Too old to produce children, they themselves, they asked the gods what they should do and were told that they should throw over their shoulders the bones of their mother earth. Having realized that that meant stones, they followed the instructions and the stones then turned into children who became the ancestors of the Greek tribes. Another story told by Hesiod in the works and days explained that there had been five generations of men of which all but one, a generation of heroes, were described as in some sense metallic, being successively gold, silver, bronze, and iron, the bronze having a steel thumos. Even Plato, in the Republic, has Socrates describe the four classes in his state as gold, silver, bronze, and iron, with the implication that the last two groups, the craftsmen and the farmers, are like metal tools for the first. Nowhere in the world do we find such chilling stories. To the Greeks, though, they seemed somehow natural and normal. So what was it in the neural formation of the Greeks that made them find such strange stories natural? To understand that, we have to remind ourselves of what was unique to the neural exposure of the, ancient, of the inhabitants of Greece as communities recovered from the turmoil of around 1000 BC. The most basic element of that exposure was the landscape, whose properties are apparent in the map. While all other coasts around the Mediterranean are smooth and uninterrupted, those occupied by Greek speakers, both on the peninsula and in the west coast of Asia Minor, are characterized by fragmented profiles of promontories and inlets, the product of, geo of a geological history which left the land divided into long valleys separated by narrow mountain ranges. As a result, <coughs> the Greeks were the were not only more exposed to bare rock than any other peoples around the Mediterranean of comparable development, they were also more exposed to seams in those rocks containing minerals from which metal, min, metals could be made. That exposure by itself, though, would not have been enough to inspire myths of stone and metal men. The Greeks must have had some compelling reason to give the rocks around them particular attention. Now, that reason was the product of particular circumstances associated with the recovery of economic life in this environment. As the villages at the bottom of those narrow valleys grew to become towns, their populations expanded until they reached their limits sustainable by their own food production. At that point, each community was liable to look covetously on the land resources of its neighbors, knowing that those same neighbors were looking covetously at theirs. Each community had to be prepared for both attack and defense. A basic need was for stone walls. Descendants of those of Mycenaean Tyrians that gave them a powerful interest in rocks. That gave, and that gave them a powerful interest in rocks. They also needed a superior military force, and since they did not have the granaries to open or allies to call on, as did their Middle Eastern or Egyptian contemporaries, that meant maximizing the effectiveness of their own youth. This involved exercising them arming them with bronze and iron weaponry, and drilling them to form a rigid phalanx, a word cognate with our plank or balk of timber. It is also meant getting into their heads and making, that's getting into the young men's heads and making them feel stronger. And one way to do that was to make them feel that they were as hard and immovable as the stones in the walls that they were building at the same time. Homer, at Iliad, in the Iliad 16, gives us a vivid image of what was required when he tells how Achilles drew up his myrmidons in a perfect phalanx. As a man, and I quote, knits together the wall of his lofty house with close-fitting stones, keeping out the force of the hot winds. Listening to his words, even today, we feel that the stone's hardness and the sharpness of the edges needed to make them join so tightly <clears throat> that even air could not pass between them. And the Greeks would have recognized the source of this image in their felt experience. As they observed the shaping of the stones that made up their defensive walls, neural mirroring would have made them sense their special properties. And knowing that they themselves needed these properties would have made them desire to embody them. The extent of the Greek warrior's empathy with stone is also brought out in the story mentioned first by Hesiod 
of how the great lyre player, Amphion, used music to cause stones to move from the landscape and form themselves into the new walls of the city of, of Thebes. The Greek warrior who felt himself to be stone-like and who was used to music moving him and giving regularity to his disciplined movements in the perfect phalanx had no difficulty in imagining stones being similarly moved by music and forming themselves into the perfect wall. No one would have needed to point out the assimilation between hoplite and stone to Greek warriors. Their neural networks would have been enough to activate the exchange between stone and man. And the benefit of that activation for the warrior would have been immediate. The more a hoplite felt himself to be stone-like, the stronger he was psychologically. No one else on the planet had ever been attracted by the idea of a stony nature, but to the Greeks, its appeal was neurologically overriding. Now, a similar empathy lies behind Hesiod's notion of metallic races. The Greek who covered himself with bronze body armor and wielded a weapon, oh, sorry, um, bronze body armor, and who wielded a weapon of iron or steel, would often have wished that his body and spirit shared their properties. A story that he was the last and the hardest of a series of metallic generations would have been highly reassuring. The fact that some at least of the ingredients of his bronze armor and iron weaponry might have been found in the veins of the rock by which he was surrounded, and of which he also felt he was made, only strengthened their, its appeal. The Greeks sense that they were made of metal, like the sense that they were made of stone, had their roots in neurally based empathy. The verbal myths in which these empathies are expressed are epiphenomenal. Their main value was to disseminate and heighten such empathy in those who listened to them. The myths made people even stronger by strengthening the neural resources in which empathy had its origin. Now, the empathy of Greek warriors was not limited to stones and minerals. It also embraced living creatures. So much is already evident in the name of Achilles' Myrmidons. They took the name, cognate with the Greek for ants, Murmikes, because when they looked at ants, they wished that they had the discipline, their discipline, their hardness, their bite, and their sting, as well as their communal solidarity. And a similar, more precise empathy is documented later in a magnificent vase painted by Euphronios. His vivid scene of warriors putting on their armor contains a visual commentary on their actions in the emblems of two of the shields. One, a crab, and one a scorpion. The warriors, we learn, feel that their armor is like the exoskeletons with which the arthropods are protected, while their weapons are as effective as their claws and sting. By communicating this feeling to their opponents, these, warriors, these emblems intimidate their opponents, especially because they are cleverly chosen to refer to conflict on land and sea, where the two arthropods come from, the two fields of Greek warfare. The viewers of these images, like the audience for the poems of Homer and Hesiod, would have understood the empathy with stone and metal objects, insects and arthropods, because many of them will already have experienced such feelings. The image, like the myths, only heightened the sensibility inherent in the nervous system. Finding that, finding that you were made of stone or metal delivered the immediate benefit of making Greek warriors feel more indestructible but it also had wider consequences for the form of formation of critical aspects of Greek culture. Most obvious is the impact on sculpture. We are used to the idea that the Greeks were the first people to adopt the practice of making life-size, lifelike statues of stone and bronze because they were the first people thoughtful enough to be interested in representational truth. But once we realize that long before they made such statues or showed any special interest in truth, they were the first people to feel themselves to be made of stone and metal, we have to rethink our position. When the Greeks made such statues, they weren't solving a problem in representation. They were showing themselves as they liked to feel themselves, stony and metallic by nature. The circumstances under which the Greeks acquired the new habit are illuminated by Herodotus, who tells us how the pharaoh Semeticus 664 to 610, received a prophecy that he would find help from bronze men who would come from the sea. Th this inspired him to employ Greek mercenaries with their bronze armor and to allow Greek traders to settle at Naucrates around 625. 
When these Greeks, who felt themselves descended from stones, came to Egypt and found statues of that material, like the figure on the left, <clears throat> they would have been inclined to empathize with them and wanted to make similar statues of themselves. Not surprisingly, those chosen for representation were those whom the prop properties of stone and metal were most desired, young men, soldiers, and athletes. They didn't make lifelike statues because they intended to, but because they felt better when they did. One of the greatest Greek achievements is a product not of conscious intention, but of unconscious neural empathy. Now, the same is true of an even greater achievement, education. Greek education has its origins in the need to prepare young males to be better soldiers. And one of the reasons why it worked so well was because of the way they felt about their origins. While all other peoples thought of themselves as made of such materials as baked clay or flour, and so fixed in nature and useless when broken, the Greek sense that they were made of stone or metal meant that they could be endlessly reworked, recut as stone, recast or rebidden if they were metal. Because the Greeks thought of themselves as made of a workable material, they readily submitted to being worked on by a set of educational tools. These expanded over time from disciplines such as gymnastics, music, and mathematics, all of which contributed... Sorry. Uh, um, uh, all of which contributed directly to making the body a more effective instrument of war, to include rhetoric, poetics, logic, and many more. The fact that the Greeks felt themselves to be made of a workable material not only made them more ready to submit to all forms of training and education, it also made them inclined to believe that such training and education would cause the changes intended. They, of course, did not know, as we do today, that they were benefiting from two fundamental properties of our neural system. It was neural mirroring that made them feel they were made of stone and metal and so endlessly shapeable in the first place, and it was neural plasticity that ensured that the reshaping really happened. This helped teachers to believe they were having an effect and encouraged pupils to feel that they were being really effective. An unconscious awareness that this was so explains why Greek teachers often use craft metaphors to bring out the essence of what they are doing, as when Plato describes how parents and teachers should manufacture or work young people into the best shape. That's in the laws. Plato also refers Im implicitly to this process in a passage in the Protagoras that brings us at last to rectangular Greeks and round Romans. This is the passage in which Socrates quotes the poem written by Simonides about 500 BC, which states, it is difficult for a good man to come into being, tetragonos, rectangular, in hands and feet and mind, wrought without blame. Now, Simonides uses the word tetuktos, wrought, a word used for shaping in a building context by Homer. And it is easy to see how, as stone walls were increasingly built out of coarse masonry, requiring the use of truly rectangular stones, rectangularity expressed the ability of the perfect hoplite to fit anywhere in the phalanx. This is why Great generals like Pericles here could be represented as, as herms that were also called tetragonos. And the same applies to uh, the Doriferous, which was also called tetragonos, and that is, of course, the model soldier. Soon the notion that the perfect man was rectangular became proverbial, as Aristotle tells us in the rhetoric. Usefully there, Aristotle also makes clear what a rectangular man is opposed to, a rounded stone, when in the same passage he quotes Odyssey 11 on Sisyphus's punishment, telling how, I quote, the shameless boulder rolled to the plain. The contrast between the shameless boulder, so the shameless round boulder, and the rectangular man wrought without blame. Uh, it well illustrates the power of metaphor. Everyone in Greece knew the stability of the rectangular stone in a wall and the random instability of the rock rolling down from a mountainside. Aristotle might also have made a similar point by quoting Iliad 13, Iliad book 13, where the contrast is between the Greek phalanx drawn up like a tower and Hector, leader of the Trojans, who attacks like a destructively rolling boulder pushed down by a stream until it comes to a halt in the plain. 
Again, the contrast is between the effective power, implicitly shaped, built out of shaped stones, and ineffective, naturally rounded boulder. Now, whether or not the fact that Hector was a Trojan, an Trojan ancestor of the Romans had an effect, it is striking that when we come to Rome, we find roundness used just as Greeks used rectangularity as the attribute of perfection. Thus, Cicero, in the Paradox of Stoicorum, gives a minor Stoic idea, a new salience, telling that the happiest man is teres atque rotundus, smooth and round. And Horace repeats the opinion in the satires, observing that the good man is smooth and round so that nothing external can attach to his polished surface. So launching an idea that is still found centuries later in Ausonius. So what could have been the source for the Roman preference for roundness. An educated Roman might have picked up on the Homeric comparison of the greatest Trojan to a boulder, but this can hardly have inspired an abiding pref preference. What might have done? There was no predominant element in Roman life which was equivalent to the military pressures that made Greek wants, Greeks want to descend from stones. Does neuroscience suggest another source? The Greeks got their interest in stones and rectangular from giving a lot of attention to walls. Was there anything in the Roman environment that might have attracted a comparable interest and so generated a preference for roundness? Now, one possible answer is the toga. The toga was a garment that had a status with few equivalents in our other cultures. As we can sense from Virgil's identification of the Romans simply in the Aeneid, simply as the gens togata, the togate race, so not the bronze race or the stone race, but the togate race. The toga was the emblem of the Roman citizen. As such, one could say that it had the same viscerally important protective function for a Roman as a city wall did for a Greek, as is demonstrated by St. Paul's appeal for legal protection, saying Civis, civis Romanus Sum. The toga was famously rounded in shape, uh, sorry, the to toga was famously rounded in shape and repeatedly contrasted with the rectangular dress of the Greeks. We thus hear that during the anti-Roman violence of the Mithridatic Wars, Roman citizens protected themselves by taking off their togas and putting on clothes that were rectangular. That's in Athenaeus. A distinction emphasized by Dionysius of Halicarnassus when he insists that the toga is not rectangular but round. Now this contrast in overall shape was also brought out in the way the material was draped. While the folds on Demosthenes' Greek dress on the left tend to be tend to the rectilinear, those of Titus's toga on the right are emphatically rounded. Indeed, Quintilian, at the same period, goes out of his way to say that the orator, that the toga of the orator should be worn rounded, rotundus. Now, the general distinction between the rectangular Greek dress and the round Roman became part of only grew under the empire as foreigners were increasingly given Roman citizenship and slaves were freed. An important part of both transformations was the acquisition of the right to wear the toga. Now the contrast between rectangular and round dress also acquired prominence from its role in the theater. A play with a Roman subject was characterized as fabula togata, while one with a Greek theme was called palliata, from pallium, the Roman name for the rectangular Greek dress. The toga was thus the emblem of Rome in the cultural field as well as the legal. Now, the importance of the distinction in dress between Greek rectangularity and Roman roundness allows us to consider the possibility that a similar distinction might have been exploited in the field of architecture. Rectangularity is certainly a salient property of all Greek architecture, <coughs> while Roman architecture prominently exploits circular plans and curved apses in the horizontal dimensions and arches, curved vaults, and domes in the vertical. There is a similar contrast in ornamental elements. While all niches in Greek buildings are rectangular in both plan and elevation, the Romans regularly employ niches that are curved in both dimensions. And again, while all Greek pediments are triangular, Romans often used ones that are segmental. The correlation with the distinction in the geometry of dress is startling. People seem to have felt that angular and rounded forms in architecture carried the same associations as they did in clothing. 
Now, this suggestion is borne out by the particular buildings in which combinations of the two forms are particularly exploited. Thus, a prominent early use of a curved niche was in the tomb of the freedman of Livia, which once stood on Rome's Via Appia, where it is framed by two niches that are rectangular. The combination may reflect the fact that some of the tomb's inhabitants would have been slaves who would have had to wear the rectangular clothes, while others would have been freemen who had donned the toga. Certainly the building type in which the alternation of rectangular and semicircular niches is found most frequently is the theater, a setting in which a, fa fabula, a fabula paliata, uh, often automated with a fabula togata. The arrangement is found in many places, as on the top of the seating at Tower Mina, at the end of the first century AD, or in front of the stage, and in the Skynai fronds at Sabratha, a century later. This distinction in the theatre is basically between two linguistic traditions, and this allows us to interpret alternations of forms in library buildings in a similar way. Pairings of Greek and Latin libraries were common in the, ancient, in the Roman world, being prominent in the Augustan temple of Apollo on the Palatine, and in the two buildings either side of the great spiral column in Trajan's Forum, and, Hadrian's great, and in great, Hadrian's great library at Athens. But in those cases, the ornamental architecture is lost. This, fortunately, is not the case with the magnificent library of Celsus at Ephesus, completed in 135 AD. Not only would the library have housed books in both Greek and Latin, but it also displays prominent inscriptions in both languages, making it highly likely that the introduction of two segmental pediments framing one that is triangular on the facade is designed to celebrate the pairing of the two cultural traditions. These segmental pediments stand out here particularly because elsewhere in the Greek East, rounded Roman architectural forms of all types were generally avoided. Here they probably reflect the pride Celsus' family felt in having been the first Greeks to have risen to the rank of Roman consul. Now this sets the scene for a reconsideration of a much more famous contemporary building in Rome itself. It has always been recognized that the Pantheon, as rebuilt by Hadrian around 123 AD, combines an essentially Greek trabeated temple facade with an essentially Roman cylinder covered by a semicircular dome. And we can now see that other elements of its architecture express the same dualism. The massive walls are thus sculpted by both rectangular and semicircular niches, which alternate around the exterior, around, alternate around the interior. It is even, uh, sorry, and the interior idicules are crowned by pediments that are both triangular and segmental. It is even possible the alternation of square and circular shapes in the flooring directly illustrates the rectangular of Greece and the roundness of Roman, of my title. Such combinations were certainly appropriate to the particular ambitions of Hadrian, coming after a period during which an excessive celebration of Italy under the Flavians, Hadrian went out of his way both to acknowledge the variety of his empire and to bring its parts together. One of the many ways he did this was by at dinner, sometimes wearing the pallium and sometimes the toga, as we learn from the Historia Augusta. This implies a certain equality in the dress types, but it is significant that he insisted that senators and equites should follow him in all ways wearing the toga when in public in Italy. And a similar prioritization of Roman values may also be implied by the preeminence of the curved over the angular in the Pantheon's architecture. Now, the influence of the contrast between Greek and Roman clothing on the visual preferences of the two communities is clear. It was expressly commented on and experienced consciously. But were there other factors that were not commented on and not experienced consciously that might have contributed to the Greeks preferring angular forms and the Romans curved? Now, a knowledge of the principles governing the plasticity of the visual cortex allows us to look for the sources of differences of visual preferences in differences in visual exposure. And since no area of visual exposure was more important than that to the natural environment, that should be the first that we should consider. If we do, a glance at the maps of the Greek and Italian peninsulas again reveals dramatic differences. 
Well, the Greek, as has been noted, has a highly fractured silhouette with many angular promontories penetrating the sea. The Italian is generally smooth and the projection small. We may think that no one thought of land masses viewed from above, but they did, as we learn from the Augustan writer Strabo. He expressly brings out something of distinction that concerns us here with his statement that Italy is not a triangle or a parallelogram, um, as claimed by some, but is bounded by two curves, that of the Alps to the north and of the Tyrrhenian coast to the west. While the shape of the Peloponnese, he says, is like the leaf of a plane tree. What is true of the difference in plan is also true in elevation. While the mountains of Greece are, Greece are often bare and jagged, those of, those of Italy, which may to English eyes at first look similar, are more rounded. Particularly striking is the contrast between the hills around which the two great cities of Athens and Rome develop. The Athenian Acropolis is a long rectangular slab with sides that were straight and near vertical before they were enhanced for defensive purposes. While the Roman Capitoline Hill, probably, which prob probably derives its name from its resemblance to a rounded head, a memory preserved in the legend that a skull was found at its summit. The same contrast is found in the surrounding mountains. The limestone and marble ranges around Athens are longitudinal and are crowned, like how I met us here, by parallel ridges. The mountains around Rome, on the other hand, are all round, many ringing circular lakes. The predictable impact of these different landscapes on the neural plasticity of the visual cortex would have ensured that the inhabitant of Athens would have had a heightened preference for the angular and the inhabitant of Rome a preference for the round. They, may, they may even have nourished preferences that are more precise. There are no two buildings that are more emblematic of the difference between Greece and Rome than the Parthenon and the Pantheon. And a closer look reveals that the difference corresponds remarkably with the difference in their surrounding landscapes. The ridged roof of the pa Parthenon which was, made of, which was made of slabs of marble from Mount Pentelicon, shares its geometry with the summit of Hymettus, which you see in here in close, us, close up. And even more remarkable is the correspondence between the Pantheon's dome with its circular perimeter framing a circular window and Monte Albano with its circular crater framing a lake. There was, of course, no intention that these in these formal echoes, but to me at least the correspondence between Rome's unique setting of nearly circular mountains and uniquely Roman dome building type suggests that the former may have influenced the latter. Now when I referred to, just now, I referred to something having a predictable impact, some of you may have winced. You were right to do so. I did too when I wrote it. Indeed, I felt challenged to verify my claim for a general impact of the rounded mountains of the Italian peninsula by looking for yet another class of visual artifacts which has artifacts which has no connection with either clothes or buildings on which I could test it. The class I took was letters, more specifically capital letters in which form is most assertive. Do the Greek and Roman alphabets exhibit the same preferences for the angular and the round that we have noted in other areas? Um, <clears throat> The answer is yes. While there are many variations in letter forms, going back to their Phoenician origins, in the alphabet, as in the architecture, the overall trends are clear. The standard forms of the Greek letters, gamma, delta, pi, and sigma, all feature angles as prominently as their Latin equivalents, oh, sorry, as, as their Latin equivalents, uh, CP, CDP, and S do curves. It is also striking that three Greek letters, alpha, delta, and lambda, share the triangular form of the Greek triangular pediment, while the curved, sorry, the curved Latin um, C and D share the broad curve of the Roman segmental variant. <coughs> Differential visual exposure to landscape seems to me the best explanation for these striking formal differences, but you may have other explanations. In the case of Greece, we noted that there was a profound influence from the Bain's inclination to neural mirroring, 
an influence which has left its trace on Greek creation myths, Greek notions of the perfect man, and Greek interest in statuary. The evidence for a comparable influence of neural mirroring on Roman culture is certainly less clear, but I hope to persuade you that it's equally remarkable. Those round mountains that we have just been looking at illustrate the key distinction of the landscape around Rome. For Rome is the only city in the world um, in which volcanoes are such a prominent feature. And you can see the, the blue lakes that fill their craters are such a prominent feature of its immediate surroundings. The geology that gives rise to volcanoes was unknown to the Romans, but they were well aware that mountains like Etna and Stromboli constantly emitted fire, and Strabo notes traces of burning on Vesuvius, which was then dormant, and in the so-called Phlegrian, or flaming, fil flaming fields nearby. Vitruvius too notes the presence of subterranean fires all around Rome, and their association with typical Roman building materials. At Trivoli, people could have seen how hot springs caused the precip pre precipitation that gives rise to Lapis Tiburtina. I illustrate this from Pamukkale in, in Turkey because everything's covered over in, 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 in Tivoli. That's the source of Travertine. And at Putrioli, they could have seen how Pozzolana, the crucial ingredient of Roman concrete, was produced in the Phlegrian or Flaming Fields which you see here. In fact, while the rocks around Athens are ancient and laid down in many layers under cool seas, Rome is surrounded by rocks that are the product of recent hot dynamic activity, flows of lava and falls of ash. Romans couldn't observe an actual eruption until 79 AD, but they could, unlike the inhabitants of any other major city, see fire and steam at work as forces in many places within 100 kilometers radius. They could also experience the kind kindred power of water in the great Tiber River. Especially at time of floods, as you see here. In comparison, the Athenian Elysus was just a trickle. Neural mirroring ensured that the empathy shaped by landscape exposure could not have been more contrasting than in the Greek and Roman cases. While the Greeks were encouraged to claim for themselves the stability and angularity of the stones with which they surrounded, the Romans acquired an empathy with power, flow, force. That the Romans were sensitive to this empathy is suggested by characterizations of the difference between Greek and Roman rhetorical style. Quintilian puts it very elegantly. We cannot be so elegant, let us be more forceful. They win in terms of refinement, let us excel in weight. Their sense of propriety is more sure, let us surpass them in our copiousness. Even the lesser talents, talents of the Greeks have their harbors, we are surely driven by larger sails, so let them be filled with a stronger wind. And Petronius captures the turning point in an orator's education with the exhortation, then let Roman authors flow around him, and unimpeded by the Greek language, let them swelling change his taste. Equally suggestive is the use of such imagery a little, late, imagery, a little later in a political context by Lucius Aeneas Florus. Florus compares the rage of Julius Caesar to both a flood and a fire, and he likens the spread of Rome's power through Italy to a forest fire. At which point, feeling myself carried away like an imperial orator, I'm tempted to go even further. Is it possible that an empathy with the forces of nature so palpable in the city's volcanic environment and its great river even contributed to fueling the energy of men like Caesar, helping to drive the astonishing rolling expansion of Roman power? Now, neuroscience gives us a reason to answer yes. Now, it used to be thought that metaphors were a purely literary device, tropes, figures of speech, verbal ornaments. But we now know that without us knowing it, they affect us neurally. Ever since Lakoff and Johnson wrote Metaphors We Live By in the 1980s, showing that metaphors have their roots not in language, but in lived experience, and since fMRI scans have allowed us to begin to identify the neural correlates of different activities, it has become more and more clear that much of the power of words derives from their capacity to engage with us vi viscerally. If I say I will kick the habit of smoking, the networks in my motor cortex that move my foot become activated, although I don't move my foot at all. If I urge you to grasp my argument, <clears throat> 
the motor area that controls your hand is liable to be activated. But you won't have felt it, but that's what happens. We don't know what would happen in a Roman's brain if he was told that his speech should flow, but I suspect <coughs> that something similar would happen, reviving real memories, perhaps, of the Tiber in flood. The Roman might have experienced riverness just as a Greek might experience stoniness. Now, this new understanding of the power of words to affect us internally is directly relevant to our understanding of the dichotomy between Greeks and Romans. The Greek word for people, laos, is homophonic, with the word for stone, laos. And the Greeks savoured this implied assimilation. Homer plays on it, and Pindar in the Olympian Odes develops it. We thus know that when a Greek thought of himself as a member of the Greek laos, or people, he or she couldn't help also feeling a bit stony. And I deliberately say feeling a bit stony, rather than think of themselves as a bit stony, because they would have had no idea that this was happening. Here, as throughout this talk, we have to learn that if we want to understand the core mental processes of the Greeks or the Romans, we should begin by talking about what they were feeling. We should only talk about thinking when they use words to express conscious ideas. And the same approach can be adopted to the word Roma. Roma is homophonic with the Greek word Rome, Roma, uh, force, violence. And that meant a Greek couldn't hear the word Roma without associating it with dynamism and strength. Neuroscience suggests how this might have shaped relations between the two cultures. A member of the Greek Laos, who was once proud of his stony immobility, was likely to feel humbled when confronted with Roman Rome. Which brings me to my last feature of classical culture, which is illuminated by neuroscience, the area of magic. Ever since J.G. Fraser demonstrated in the Golden Bough that magic was a worldwide phenomenon and that an important type was sympathetic magic, it has been clear that magic is rooted in universal traits of the human nervous system. And now neuroscience allows us to see those roots. It can, for example, reveal why sticking a pin into a doll with an individual's name attached seems magically to cause damage to the individual concerned. In a mod if, if a modern experimental, experimental subject sees, if a modern experimental subject sees a nail being stuck into the hand of someone who is a friend or a relative, they will experience activation of a pain center in the insula, which is where you feel pain, just as they would if the snail was stuck into their own hand. They don't experience the pain, but they experience its psychological consequences. And this understanding of the neural basis of magic helps us to understand other cultural practices not normally associated with magic. It can, for instance, show why damnatio memoriae was so effective. When the statue of someone like Sejanus or T Nero was decapitated or an inscription with his name erased, all of those who were his friends would have, been, well, would have suffered while all those who were his enemies would have felt pleasure. Once we appreciate the extent to which the effects of damnatio memoriae depended upon unconscious neural responses, we can apply the same knowledge to understanding how people might have reacted to other material expressions, such as architectural elements. Take, for example, the capital we know as composite, the type which was never, a type which was never referred to in antiquity. The person who identified it as an order was Leon Battista Alberti in the 15th century. And he saw its combination of what had once been two absolutely separate forms, Ionic and Corinthian, as an expression of Roman power, over the, Roman power over the Greeks and everyone else. That was why he named it Italic, in contrast to all the Greek orders. That Alberti was right is suggested both by its being first introduced on a monument that celebrates Roman triumph, the Arch of Titus, and by its association with other members of the Flavian dynasty who were known for their revival of Italian culture after a period when it, Italian culture had been neglected by the Grecophile Nero. It is thus not surprising if this form was introduced to express the triumph of things Italian, Roman Rome, if you like. Its effects were magical because the sight of it had the power to cause pain in every Greek and pleasure in every Roman. 
without them realizing it. The emergence of the systematic practice of demnatio memoriae and the introduction of the composite capital are metamagical practices that occurred at a time in the first century AD when conventional magic was also on the rise, as we know from Pliny the Elder, who launches a violent attack on the phenomenon in the natural history. But Pliny could not escape the charms of magic, and he provides a useful example of a more positive magic in, in the reef knot, or so-called knot of Hercules. This owed its power to its symmetry and to the way it gets stronger the more you try to pull it apart. Pliny recommends its use both in the bandaging of a wound and in a girdle worn every day. The Roman generals acknowledged its potency as we see from its prominence on many statues. The reason its magic worked was because everyone remembered from their own experience how pill pulling on the two ends only strengthened the knot. That was why sight of the knot promoted a sense of security. Sight of the emblem or action known as the dextrarum junctio had a very similar effect as here, where it resolves anxiety about disunity in the army. So it's about concordia executum. Memory of the reassurance felt when two individuals shook hands as equals, whether they were two powerful individuals or just husband and wife, meant that all who saw either the emblem or the action shared that feeling. That was its magic. Understanding the magic power of such pairings as the knot of Hercules or the dextrarum junctio, we can look again at the pairings that feature so prominently in the architecture of the Pantheon. Perhaps they possess a similar magic, while the brutal fusion of Ionic and Corinthian elements in the composite or Italic capital was a reassuring emblem of Rome's absolute dominance over Greece, promoted by the Italophile Flavians, here the symmetrical pairing of Greek and Roman elements was a reassuring emblem of two cultures' equality as promoted by Hadrian. So too, of course, was his changing between Greek and Roman dress at dinner, but that was an act that was experienced consciously what made the alternation of elements in the architecture magic was the fact that it affected people unconsciously. Without them knowing it, the people who entered the Pantheon would have left it with some of the, their anxieties about cultural tensions in the Roman Empire reduced. With which recognition of the possible benefits of a purely passive exposure, I am tempted to wonder how effective my own attempt at magic has been this evening. If it has worked, you will feel some empathy with Greek rectangularity and with Roman roundness. And if you do, you will share the associated benefits in terms of your own self-consciousness. If you sense what it meant to a Greek to be made of stone or metal, you will feel stronger and also more malleable. If you sense what it meant to a Roman to be like the force of nature, you will feel more dynamic and more able to have impact on others. Hopefully, you will also know that you owe these new sensibilities to the particular properties of your brain, especially its neural plasticity and its capacity for neural mirroring. And if you know that, you would agree that neuroscience can shed light on, can shed light on the formation of classical culture. Which brings me to my last wish for this, this event this evening. Hadrian wanted his pantheon to persuade people that there was no incompatibility between the cultures of Greece and Rome. I would like this lecture persuade people that there is no incompatibility between the approaches to the mind that we are all used to using and those opened up by the latest neuroscience. If you are persuaded of that, the magic will have worked. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for such a wide-ranging and stimulating lecture. We've learned not only about Greek rectangularity and Roman circularness, but I think at the same time, like, rather like Ernst Gombrich amongst his uh, hippopotami, we've learned to be moulded in your own mental image. Um, I think before we go and have a well-deserved glass of wine, John has very kindly um, offered to take a couple of questions for five, ten minutes or so. There'll be a further chance to have a talk with John over a glass of wine upstairs in chapters. But are there any questions that people would like to raise straight away? I think we have a microphone somewhere. Is that right? Perfect. So if you stick into the microphone, then we can make sure we can hear. Can we start with Professor Jeremy Tanner? Um, I'd like to ask um, why you think that Greek shields were round 
and Roman shields were rectangular and what kind of impact that would have had um, when they were fighting. If I was, I mean, a, a joking response would be to say, the Greeks made their shields round because they really thinking about the drinks they were going to have afterwards. And so it was going to be like the shape of the drinking cup. Um, and I think the, the I mean, the, the point is there are, there are other reasons why, but it's, but you're absolutely right. That is, I mean, it's, it's a question that I've, I've, I've reflected on, but I think the Romans wanted the shape of a shield which they could use. If you put rectangular shields together, you can produce a perfect testudo to advance and uh, protect yourself from missiles coming from on top. But so obviously, I'm not suggesting that everything in Greece is rectangular and everything in, in Rome is, is round. I'm saying I, the particular phenomena that I'm dealing with is what I'm trying to explain. Are there any other questions? So one down this way. Yes, you may. Uh, Still hold on. You just wait one second. We'll bring the microphone over. Perfect. Everyone can hear. But um, yeah. So I was just wondering about um, expressions of the sort of neural link in Egyptian archaeology, sort of association with gold kind of things being indestructible or eternal, um, the pyramids, and even in places like um, Della Medina, we have quite poor stonemasons who are attempting to construct pyramid-like structures out of stone. So did the Greek sort of exposure to North Africa um, influence this, do you think? Or is it a completely sort of domestic event, if you would? Well, I I mean, obviously, I mean, the role of stone in Egypt is, is very important, but it has completely different, uh, different roots. And it's, 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 I say, it's, and it's, there's, but there's, the big influence was obviously that when the Greeks went to Egypt, they saw stone buildings, they saw stone statues, and they saw stone buildings, and they, they liked them, um, and they made more of it. But I don't think they, I don't think there was a particularly cultural contact between, I think, what I've been, the ideas I've been talking about today are ideas that I think they generated out of their own uh, neurally based experiences. Okay. We'll take one last question, I think, from right there in the back, if you can get the microphone there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I know it wasn't subject to your talk, but I'm thinking of the Etruscans because they lived in Italy like the Romans, and Italian, well, Roman architecture is shaped or influences much by the Etruscans as the Greeks. And a lot of Etruscan architecture, except the tumuli, is, is rectangular like the Greek. Uh, how do you explain that? Or how do you sort of fit that into your uh, thesis? Well, it doesn't, I mean, I, 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 Everything, obviously, the Romans made lots of rectangular buildings. I mean, it's, that's, that's not, not at all. Just, I'm trying to, we're looking at the history of architecture, and we suddenly find these, these particular rounded forms that I'm talking about emerging. My task is to explain that. Uh, I don't need to explain the presence of rectangular forms because they appear you know, sort of all, over, all over the world. I mean, Etruria it, it, it it is relevant because, I mean, at least... This is an aside. People ask themselves, why is you know, sort of Etruscan art so ropey compared to Greeks, to Greek art? Because they were trying to do the same thing. They tried to copy the pot, they tried to scope it, scope. And I think that the reasons why Etruscan art is, 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 is ropey, it looks squidgy, soft, it, is, is simply because they are surrounded by this, uh, these rounded forms in the landscape. So it's in, for the same reason that, I mean, the alphabet, the rounded letters in the, in the Roman alphabet, you know, come from Etruria. In other words, you can already see that the softness of the landscape, because I can't say what else is in the, is there, there is in the water, as it were, that stores it, is making forms there rounded, and it was, and it, it did weaken their artistic expression in, in architecture, it weakened it in sculpture, and uh, it weakened the letter form which didn't matter. Interesting, thank you. <clears throat> At this point, um, I have been called on to bring proceedings to an end. 
Uh, I'm Hugh Bowden. I'm the head of the Department of Passage for three weeks. Uh, and I have two tasks which I will perform in reverse order. So the second task is to invite you all to a reception <coughs> immediately after uh, we leave here in chapters, which is in the room directly above this theatre. Um, the way to get there when you go out is to turn either left or right uh, until you find some steps to take you up. Uh, but there are some helpfully red clad student uh, assistants here who will guide you on your way. Um, so that's the second task. My first task before that um, is to offer some thanks. Uh, and again, two thanks to um, come in two parts. First, I want to thank uh, all of those involved in the creation and maintaining of uh, the Jamie Rundle Memorial Fund. On behalf of the Department of Classics, and in particular those students who have experienced the trips uh, that have been organized so far, some of whom are here in the audience, which they were earlier, actually. They still are. Um, and secondly, uh, on behalf of everyone here, I hope, uh, to the fund for making possible uh, this lecture uh, and its predecessor, and indeed its successor, which is happening uh, in a year's time, more about which uh, will be advertised nearer the time. But the other thanks obviously goes to our speaker. Um, Roddy said at the start of this, uh, pointed out that high up in the team's uh, administration, we have a neuroscientist um, and an art historian. Uh, what uh, this lecture has shown is that you need a classicist to combine the two imaginatively <laughs> and effectively. Uh, and John started by saying, what was it uh, that his title immediately made you think of? Well, I'm going to slightly cheat because I couldn't read the title without reading the name of the person giving the lecture. <coughs> and what that made me think is that whatever it was going to be about, it would be far more surprising, far more wide-ranging, uh, and far more challenging uh, than any type, than, than one would imagine whatever one's 